Hi there everyone. Today's guest on Objectivity needs no introduction, but if I don't introduce him, I haven't got a job to do, so I'm gonna do it. This is Hank Green. You know him from all sorts of YouTube channels, Vlog Brothers, Crash Course, SciShow, best-selling author, podcasts, but today, finally, you can add to your CV, Objectivity guest. You've made it. I mean, I'm in this room, which is very worth the walk over in the rain. It's nice, isn't it? It's a pretty room. Now, a little birdie told us that you're a bit of a Charles Darwin fan. It was me. It was you. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big Charles Darwin fan. So I spoke to Keith, Keith Moore, head librarian here at the Royal Society, and he's dug out some Charles Darwin treasures to show us, starting with the man. Look at this, look at this painting. This is normally on the wall in the council chamber of the Royal Society. Keith, what are we looking at? We're looking at Charles Darwin in the last year of his life. Mm. This is a very famous portrait. The original is by John Collier. That's in the Linnaean Society. And then it was much copied. So our copy is early 20th century. And it's a rather fine picture of him, I think. He's looking like he's just out from the rain. He might well be, because yeah. these are his old gardening clothes, his winter set of gardening clothes. Mm -hmm. He looks all right there to me, seeing it up close. His eyes still look very crystal clear. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's not a photograph. They probably, there's a bit of license. Be yeah. nice. Face tune. Yeah, made it a bit more flattering. It represents the iconography of Darwin that, that came along after his death. Of course, he's, he becomes massively famous. Mm -hmm. I love it. He looks like he's seen some things, and he has. What have we got here, Keith? What are we gonna show Hank next? This is him striding across the Galapagos mm -hmm. Islands, and you can tell that because there are various right, right. things dotted around here, iguana and, and finches and so on. This is a modern work. This is a contemporary maquette for a very large statue at Shrewsbury School. James can probably just home in on the signature here. This is by Gemma Pearson. It's beautiful. You like it? Yeah, don't step on him. <laughs> no, they're not gonna like, bite you or anything. He's got good boots on. He's an adventurer. He's been on a boat for a long time. I approve. What would you do with this? Would you put this like in your office or something? I would probably let a museum have it. You'd give it to a museum? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. <laughs> That's what Keith likes to hear. Yep. Which of these two, if you were going to be given one as a gift, which would you want? First of all, who has a wall this big? I mean, I think that this is sort of the classic image. This is sort mm. of what in your mind's eye, this is the cover of the book. But like seeing as discoveries are happening, as the ideas are forming, is pretty amazing Yeah. to think about. We have one more. Again, this is like, yeah, this is like that that's the of, thing. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. furrowed brow. Yeah, they weren't doing eyebrow trimming back then; just grooming. So this is a sculpture bust by Horace Montford from 1898. Again, it's a posthumous work, and the thing that these three objects have in common is that none of them are lifetime works of Darwin. This, mm -hmm. this is the, the kind of the fame he right. had after he died. We have one more image of Darwin to show you, though. Okay. And the interesting thing about this one... Can't see it. <laughs> no. We've kept it as a surprise okay. for you. Because this is the image of Darwin that he most liked. Do you want to see it? Oh, yeah. You wait here. I'll get it. Are you ready? Yeah. This is it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But look here. I like this photograph very much better than any other which has been taken of me. Charles, Charles Darwin. Darwin. My signed it. <laughs> There you hey. go. He's like, well done, whoever took this photograph, which There's we probably know. Probably the most famous Victorian photographer, Julia Margaret Cameron. Oh. Very fa fantastic photographer. It's very nice to know that we know for sure <laughs> which photograph of Darwin was Darwin's favorite. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what else this confirms. Those eyebrows. He liked them. Like that wasn't just like exaggerated for the sculpture. Have a look, Those, they're serious. Uh huh. But this would be his Twitter profile pic, obviously. Like, <laughs> that, that has been made clear to us. Yeah. This must add a lot of value to the picture. Oh, yeah. It? Uh, it's a very valuable photograph. I do handle carefully, Brady. All right, now I'm putting it down. Okay. <laughs> Let's go over the other <laughs> side of the room. Let me take that, Brady. You take that. <laughs> and we're going to go the other side of the room and show you a couple more things. All right, I'm very excited. First of all, <laughs> Thanks. Keith, what? I think that's called pandering. Yeah. Available Just... in all good bookstores. <laughs> <laughs> The most important books in the Royal Society, oh, on one take. Great, great. 
First of all, Charles Darwin was, of course, a fellow of the Royal Society. And what do we have here, Keith? So this is the election certificate. This is why he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society. And the various signatures are his proposers, seconders and supporters. So he's elected, you can see here, January the 24th, 1839. So the various names are people like George Peacock, one of his great friends, a mathematician. We've got Herschel there. John George Children. Here's uh, James Clark Ross, the explorer. Had he written his famous book at this point? On the Origin of Species? No, that's 1859, so this oh, is 20, so 20 years to go on this. Okay, so he's yeah. already like, he's yeah. already like, you know, a big, big enough deal to get in the Royal Society. Yeah, I yeah, think... And he's got a lot of buds already. He's like, got a lot of friends in the Royal Society, that helps. Mm -hmm. And he's a gentleman naturalist. And at this period, if right. you were a gentleman, and you're a bit interested in natural history, you were in. Mm -hmm. If you could pay your subscription, of course. Okay. Right. <laughs> this is the Royal Society Charter Book. And anyone who becomes a member of the Royal Society will sign this book. And wow. Isaac Newton through to Stephen Hawking. This is like the ultimate science autograph book. You'd be amazed all the names you find in here. It's like somebody got inked out. Yep, non-payment of subscriptions. Unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> there ah. he is. Ah, we got him. You saw it instantly as soon as we were on the page. Charles Darwin. That Good. doesn't look like English. It isn't. No. It's Arabic. Yeah. Do you have any idea why? Uh, this was the Moroccan ambassador. No. Oh. He knows exactly why. Why, yeah. do, why would I think he wouldn't know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got one more thing we want to show you about mm -hmm. Charles Darwin. So this is a very battered little book, mm. but this is books borrowed from the Royal Society Library. Oh. So one of my predecessors kept this book just to record who had what. Mm -hmm. And because this is a 19th century one, you can see quite a few of the people here are pretty famous. Look, Charles oh. Darwin again. <laughs> so this is like being able to look at his internet search history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every book or journal that Darwin yeah. got out of the library. He appears on most pages. He seems wow. to be quite a, quite a regular in, reader. In and out a lot. Yeah. 1850s? 1858. This is 1858. So this is just on the run up to 1859 when, mm -hmm. when The Origin of Species is out. So this is when he's it's, writing and thinking yeah, about that. Yeah, kind of more of the fire has been lit under him. You think that's his actual handwriting then? That is. Some of these are the librarian just signing things out for them, but that's certainly Darwin's signature, yeah. Just as an aside, this one's fun because here's Faraday himself taking out a copper plate, like a an engraving plate from the Philosophical Transactions, which is like the, the journal. Mm -hmm. But the first thing Keith noticed when he saw it, not returned. <gasps> Everything else is marked returned. Michael Faraday kept his copper plate. Stole a copper plate. I know. That doesn't I, sound cheap. Yeah, that's probably melted down for an experiment by now. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the banes did, of our existence. Yeah, he, did, he didn't actually need the information. He needed yeah, copper. Just need the yeah, just needed copper. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so Hank, you asked whether or not the things that Right. Darwin was borrowing mm -hmm. still exists. Well, and that's the wonderful, like you could actually see what he was reading. I think you can guess what's coming. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so, I know how video gets edited. <laughs> so this is Charles Darwin mm -hmm. borrowing a book in late 1858, so this is November, and he's borrowing five volumes of Audubon. Now, J.J. Audubon wrote the most famous bird book ever published. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Birds of America, you, you must know this one. I do, I have an Audubon print on my wall. Fabulous, oh, wow. yeah, they're very, very beautiful things. Now, of course, the Royal Society couldn't possibly afford to buy those ones, yeah. but it did have yeah. the five volumes of the descriptions of the plates. We have them here, and this is what Darwin is borrowing. So Darwin would have been sitting back in a chair or at a desk with these actual copies and yep. thumbing so he, through them. And he, he would have read these, yeah, yeah. So whether he wanted them for a particular purpose or whether he just wanted to have a read, I don't know. Got some checkouts up here. Yeah, it's got, it's got the librarian's red biro. <laughs> um, we don't like talking about the practices of past librarians. No, we don't. We really don't. But this is quite fun. I mean, he's, he's quite maudlin, Audubon. Yeah. So here he is. This is an introduction to volume five. And he says, How often, good reader, have I longed to see the day on which my labours should be brought to an end? <laughs> Many times when I have laid myself down in the deepest recesses of the western forests, have I been suddenly awakened by the apparition of dismal prospects. Darwin, <laughs> check this out, just to read this emo scientist stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, like, he yeah. needed that. He yeah. needed someone to commiserate with him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for the Keith audiobook of this now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I could do that here. Yeah. Oh, so you have lots of uh, details of birds, gizzards, and things nice. like that, and intestines in here. But they're really good plates, of course, are oh, the big ones. Oh, there my. we go, as read by Darwin himself. His search history, his library borrowing. Mm-hmm. And, the, and his, own, his own books, which he did return. Yeah, he did return. He's not like okay. Faraday. <laughs>
I don't think Darwin would have written on a library book. Oh, well, Benjamin Franklin did, but he's an American. <laughs> <laughs> And we have another object here. Yeah, it's also thought to have been Isaac Newton's, and it is definitely an instrument from the same period. It has been done by an English engraver who made this beautiful equinoctial ring dial. Equinoctial ring dial. This ring goes like this. Ah. And if you hold it up higher, underneath it gives the 12 hours yep. on both sides. So you should be able to read the time at any latitude in the world, because you can change the sides of it, and you can change the latitude and the month and then you should be able to read the time by looking at the sun. 